So, stream on, stream on. So folks, I'm waiting for someone to appear online because I don't have many people in the class. So I assume that uh, plenty of you will be, or plenty, some of you, normally we have around 30 per year, will be attending from home. Right now they are only four. Pity. Three, one, disappeared. Well, so, uh, let's start the first lesson. So welcome to the uh, notorious probabilistic robotics course uh, within the Master of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. Um, in, today we will have two lightweight lessons, right? Like, let's start calm. Uh, we will have an introduction of the course and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, mobile robots and sensors, so just uh, to acquaint. Um, w once in a while I will have to uh, look at the number of uh, concurrent viewers, which is only six. Um, uh, so this course is now at his, uh, I think, fifth edition or sixth edition, so it starts to be kind of mature. And it has been uh, uh, the outcome of uh, uh, the efforts of me, of many friends, and many people like uh, along the line. What you see here is a bunch of PhD students, uh, professors, friends uh, that contributed in a way or in another to the creation of this material. Uh, context, so like uh, who do you have to blame for the course? It's obviously me. And uh, uh, we will be assisted by two tutors. One is Barbara, uh, which is probably one of the six viewers uh, on YouTube now. And the other one is Tiziano, which is currently in Germany. Now, probably we will have a support tutor that will replace um, uh, Tiziano while he's uh, uh, spending his PhD period abroad. The email, the email. Uh, for appointments, uh, there was this email, but now I will delete it. For appointments, you just like write directly to me. And I will also fix the slide because uh, otherwise you, you know, read the slide. For appointments, once there was a person that uh, uh, um, offered to handle the, the secretariat of the course, uh, but uh, it's no longer uh, there. So we, so it's alive, but it's not doing the job. So uh, we take the appointments on ourselves. Uh, please, when you write emails about the course, given that I have, I think, four or five courses in the faculty, in the, in the, in the course of studies, I don't know anymore uh, what you're talking about. So typically, in the prefix of the email, you write uh, the course you're referring to. When is the exam? Uh, right? Uh, teaching material. I mean, classical uh, uh, course, uh, Grisetti style, I mean, you have two sources of uh, the material. One is the web page, which is probably something you know already because it's there. You can click on it and uh, we will publish all the, the videos of the, of the lessons online and we will update the site regularly. Uh, and also we will use the site for some sort of uh, uh, any time information, when are the exams, uh, where are the rooms, and these sort of things. Uh, but the material itself, the teaching material, will be stored in a Git repository, which is accessible by the link below, or is accessible directly from the site. You, you go on teaching material, you have a material, you have a, 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 a repository with all the slides updated and corrected as long as we proceed. Let me see if I have some more audience. Six. Oh, six. Oops. Not cooperative. 
Sorry, I am, I, I am I, I'm becoming this, this audience freak now because I have only one monitor and I don't manage to figure out. But next time I'll buy a splitter. I have to monitor how many people I have remotely. Uh, And then uh, starting from uh, the, 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 the course, like where, why this course was born? It was born because I, I like robots and I personally like also building things that in general work. And robots, I mean, normally they have to work. And I mean, I will add something more. A robot which is useful is also dangerous because a robot which is useful is big, typically, right? And if it's big, it can make damage, right? And you don't want the robot to make damage. So, like, sort of, uh, I mean, of course, uh, to have a, a system, imagine that this object over here, which weighs 200 kilo falls on your foot, you're not happy, right? You want to prevent that. Now, there are many, uh, uh, many components in such a system, and you have already encountered the sense plan ar ar architecture. I mean, uh, you have done uh, the, a lot of planning, a lot of uh, kinematics in, in, in uh, uh, robotics, in the robotics course that you have already followed. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, normally in order to do this planning you need to have a configuration of the world which is as accurate as possible inside your system so you need to estimate, estimate where the things are and how to move with them uh, like in there no, you don't only need to have a perfect uh, idea of how to carry on the actions uh, if uh, the world you're carrying on these actions is different from the, the real world that it is because you estimated it incorrectly so if you try to open a door which is not existing that's going to happen, right? And we are in this course in the context of uh, the sensing part. Um, before going deeper, I uh, recall that uh, I didn't mention, but by looking at the uh, people here, I think it's quite uh, uh, obvious. This course is a course of the second year of uh, the master, right? It's a course of the second year because it requires to know knowledge that you acquired in the first year. Now, how, it come, how does it come that it's uh, offered in the first year and not in the second year? I already told the story, because in the past, when this course was established, I asked, uh, they asked me, when do you want this course, on the first or on the second year? I said, on the second year. When do you want it, on the first or on the second semester? I said, the second semester. Accordingly, the course was put at the first semester in the first year, right? And then uh, I have realized something about the GOMP, the system for managing the teaching, that it's immutable. Once you write something in it, it has to stay. I could move it to the second year, but it would, would, this would require an insane bureaucratic burden. And for one year, I will have to either to stop the course or to provide a twice the same course necessarily to different timings. Okay? So it's not possible. So we keep it as it is, you know that it's uh, the second year, we will adjust, we typically adjust the timetable because my colleagues are aware of it in a way that uh, you can migrate from one part of the other and you can attend uh, the course, right? Uh, so said, this was an administrative information. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the state because in the sense plan act architecture, a central notion of in general of a dynamic system is the state. What is the state? Well, it depends on, the, on, the, on what you're doing. I mean, we're normally working with dynamic system. Also, your laptop here is a dynamic system. It has a state. And the state is the... What is the state of a, of a computer while it's running? The state of, of a computer while it's running. The RAM status? Yes? More? The 
CPU status, right? If you don't have anything else attached. Because if you freeze your computer, you freeze your RAM, and you do it when you suspend anything, and you freeze the CPU state, you could at a certain point re restart exactly from where you interrupted the thing, only by recovering the memory and recovering the CPU state. And from that point on, the CPU will keep on running. Okay? This gives you a quite uh, a neat intuition of what the state is. The state is all I know, need to know about the past in order to evolve in the future. Right? That's the notion of the state. Or all I need to know. It, actually, like it doesn't even... Uh, uh, it's not even necessarily temporarily related because you could reach to two, two conf the same configuration of the RAM in two different ways, right? You could do you, you, you can have two instructions: add A B and add B C, add uh, C D, right? You could swap them, and you will have the same result, right? So it doesn't matter how you reach that state. The state is a set of variables that freezes what that freezes the past that captures all it has happened in the past in order to continue and predict the future. Okay? So it doesn't matter how you reached the state, how it, did you come to a certain configuration in order to predict what you will be doing, if, uh, if you know that, that all the variables which are relevant are there. Like, for instance, in a decision process, well, if you want only to plan something in the future, you might only be interested in the current configuration, how, how the things look like. But if you want to put in some other uh, reasoning, maybe, uh, I don't know, you don't want to visit uh, the same uh, uh, room twice, huh? or, or you don't want to, uh, you have some constraints that depend on the history, then these constraints, or this, some data that summarizes these constraints, has, has to be incorporated in the state. Because otherwise you're not going to be able to predict, to evolve, to calculate what you want to calculate in the future. Understood? I mean, there's a difference between me and my uh, girlfriend, like, uh, for instance, I could eat the very same thing every day. Right? I don't matter, I mean, as long as it's enough. And she is very picky because she likes to, uh, oh, I ate that last week. Isn't it good, right? Like in order to, we have two different states. My state is, have I eaten, haven't I eaten? Her state is what I have eaten in the last week, right? With a discount factor, maybe, in order to predict uh, what she will be like. So this state, the concept of state is that you have to know, is all the information about the past, or a set of variables that allows you to predict the future. Uh, at least this is my notion of state, the classical Markovian state. Uh, in case of a robot, depending on what we have to do, the state might comprise the geometry of the environment, for instance. If you have to grab an object, you need to know how, are, how is the occupied and free space in front of you. Uh, if you have, are dealing with a robot that has to navigate, like, for instance, an autonomous car or a differential track pattern that has to go from A to B, well, you might also have a notion of map, because maybe you have a fantastic visual map of the environment that allows you to, to um, uh, go, like to localize yourself perfectly in the environment. But that might not be sufficient, because you need to have a traversability information. You need to know where you can walk, because maybe there's uh, water in front of you, right? And water is not traversable unless you are a boat. So that might go into the state or the location of potential moving object, still thinking about this autonomous car. The location, their velocities, whatever you need in order to be able to drive safely. Okay? Also, other items that we will commonly encounter in the state of the robot uh, are, in general, uh, its configuration, like, uh, the kinematic parameters of a robot. So if you have a, a differential drive platform, let's say, or a mobile robot, whatever, uh, that has to last for some days of mission. Well, what 
might happen is that the tires will, if it has tires, might deflate. Or depending on the load that you put on the platform, some wheel might be, you know, squeezed with respect to some other wheel, thus reducing the appearance radius. And if you want to do millimeter docking, because you are maybe a mobile manipulator that needs to operate into a robotic cell, then you have to estimate dynamically your kinematic parameters, the variation of the kinematic parameters. Same, same as dynamics, obviously, you know, if you are loaded or not loaded, well, have you ever tried to, to load a, a car which is completely, you know, stuffed with things? It's not as reactive, especially if it doesn't have horsepower. Uh, other thing that might be relevant to you is the state of the batteries, whatever digital thing that you, can, you, you might load. Of course, the state, one is not interested in estimating a state that has everything inside. The definition of state is quite goal-oriented. What do I have to do with this robot? And then the interest is to put in the state the minimum that you can, right? Because we don't want to do, do useless activities. Clear, guys? Yes? Uh, uh, make me an example. Uh, as, as wait, I have to repeat for the audience. Um, um, uh, um, your colleague in the, in the uh, hall asks uh, whether the goal can be included in the state. I mean, I, I'm not that, uh, uh, that um, religious on that. I th think uh, if the goal has to be estimated, maybe, I would say. But depending on, on, on what do, do we mean about goal. So normally a, a complex robotic system is cascaded. And then the goal of one system is the result of the estimation of another system that has to do some sort of calculation. Right? Right. Is you have to have, uh, looking at the state, you have all the elements in order to predict something. And that something maybe uh, could be the goal, but in the state. Uh, I mean, this is quite philosophical. I mean, normally, normally think about the, the state as a configuration of the world that you want to reach, right? Or a like normally you, you define the goal as a configuration of these state variables. That's a, a, different, a, way, a kind of neat way of defining the thing. So like cap here, cap on the table. And that's not the goal state. How you reach it, now you might say, uh, what if I have a, a system that has to estimate, has to decide or to estimate? Has to decide. Uh, deciding is a different thing because it's in the future. Estimating is like, I, I state is something that is actual, that is now, and it has been. And it might be, but it might be different uh, uh, depending on the actions that you're gonna take. Let's see if there are questions in the, sorry guys, I have to see uh, if I have questions in the live streaming. Ah, okay, Francesco, Francesco uh, answered what, what uh, uh, you answered. I mean, Barbara, if you are alive, a uh, bit a uh, shot, um, because uh, uh, I, I don't manage to handle the people in the class and the people at home. Technical mess. Uh, continue. Okay, now, state is a bunch of numbers. No? State in general, now you are at a certain year of, of AI, you normally would, out, the problem is that, the, the aspect is that all we're gonna talk about, we tend to, to, we have to program it, right? So normally, we have to build a program that does something. And the state will be materially represented in your program as a set of uh, uh, variables, right? Or a set of data structures in general. That's how you're gonna code it. And we will also have quite some uh, interactions with, with, the, with the coding business in the course. There's a promise. So, uh, I say, and this could be an easy, you did some course of that, uh, of this sort. I think you did it in uh, uh, the control engineers guys uh, that I might have some uh, in the classroom that you might have done system identification, right? That's an exam which is called system identification. That's 
tells you how to estimate the stress. Why do you talk about uh, probabilities then? Well, we talk about probabilities, so in this course we focus a lot on, on, on the probabilistic aspects, uh, because, uh, because we're lazy. So normally when we model a dynamic system, we don't model it perfectly. We have some nominal values. It's gonna fall here. We have some nominal values. We have some, we model a differential drive robot with the, with the axis of the wheel, which are, uh, with the two wheels which have the same uh, rotation axis. Once you mount it, you figure out that they are mounted like that. Once you uh, estimate the masses or, or, or you mount it and, and, and so on, even if you can then try to calibrate it, you will never have a perfect calibration. And this calibration might change depending on whether the hand effector of your arm or whatever is grabbing something or not, because it changes the dynamic parameters. You move the masses somehow, okay? Uh, and this is one source. But normally, in order to do and build a system, trust me, the best way is to code something which is as simple as possible. Because once you, you approach a problem, the common tendency is like to include libraries to think about the more complicated thing ever. And then in the end, you collapse into the complexity of the problem. Normally, you can, the, the best thing is to find the smallest abstraction that represents the reality in interest. And this is how you solve the problem, by trimming it down, okay? So sometimes, uh, and once you have a small model, small, like not complex thing, then you can carry on very complicated analysis on that. Okay? And so sometimes, uh, even if there is the possibility of modeling something very accurately or very precisely, like investing a lot of effort, that's going to be too computationally expensive, on the one hand, to, to carry on the, estima the, the estimation there, just to handle this model. And uh, sorry, guys, uh, is it possible to destroy this? Uh, uh, So, normally we, we want to have a model that is as simple as possible, that's the thing. And by making it simple, we can't make it too accurate. And normally we prefer to make it simple. But making it simple means that there is some sort of inaccuracy that is not going to be predicted, some sort of expected, potentially predictable behavior that is not represented in the model that we have written, just because we, want, because we wanted to make it simple. Like a manipulator has elasticity, right, into, into, the, into the joints. But sometimes you don't want to model the elasticity. And if you don't model the elasticity, it means that if you move very quickly, then the arm is going to slightly bend. But then you, how do you carry on estimation? Well, you don't have any more a predicted future state, a predicted future position, configuration of the end effect. But you have a set of potential position of the end effect. Instead of being deterministic, you become stochastic. You say, I have a family of possible solutions. Understood? Uh, and normally, this is the big part of the, of, the, uh, of the probability. On the other hand, there are disturbances that affect the measurement of the system. I mean, disturbances that are uh, noise, classical electrical noise that enters in some amplifier and gets uh, magnified. Uh, like, for instance, you can look at this picture here. I don't know if you can appreciate it. Here you have uh, the same image acquired with, a, with two different light conditions. Like, uh, just to explain better, like a camera, uh, in a camera you have three parameters. I don't know how many of you are interested in photography, but there are three games. And to make a nice photo, all you have to do is to get enough light into the film or into the CCD. Okay? Now, how do you get, imagine light, light is some sort of, a, of water, right? You have a stream of water which is and you have to get enough water into this, this CCD, right? 
and you can play on two things. One thing is the pressure of the water, which we could see as if it was the light intensity. The brighter, the less time I will have to keep the, the, the tap open. Okay? And that's the, the, the intensity. Of course, if given a certain intensity of light, because it's not, you want to take a picture of that scene or not of another scene, what, what you can play with is the time that you keep the, shut, the, the, the tap open, so the shutter open. And that's called exposure time, right? So the longer the exposure time, the more light is passing into the film. This is one variable. The other variable is the aperture, the, the, the diaphragm aperture. I don't know if you have seen the, uh, the, the photos, the classical photos, the okay? That's a hole. The narrower is the hole, the more the image will be crisp around the focal point. If you want to have, there's a thing which is called the depth of field. If I want to, have you ever taken the, the, with your phone a photo of a really near object? Then you see that the near object is on focus, but anything else is out of focus, right? If you would have a very narrow aperture, you would have everything which is on focus, also behind. But you would have to stay very long with the phone still, because you tighten the hole, and more light, you have to then, in order to ensure that there is enough light passing, you have to prolong the exposure. There is a third game, so exposure, aperture, there is a third game that we have to play with, so, I mean, also lessons of photography in Providence People Park, which is the size of the film, like the sensitivity of the film, the ISO, the ISO number. Now, the, the higher the ISO number, the more sensible will be your, 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 your film. But the more sensible is your film. Actually, it's implemented in CCD by amplifying the signal. Now, if you have a very weak signal, this means that uh, this weak signal will be much more subject. If you have the same disturbance on a weak signal, and you amplify it a lot, you amplify also the disturbance. And that's what happens in this picture. This picture here is taken with an ISO, which is higher, which means uh, I'm more sensible, but increase the noise. So disturbances, this is an example of where you find the disturbances. Uh, and uh, for this and for a lot of other reasons, we tend to not to reason in terms of probabilities, uh, of um, absolute values of quantities, but in terms of probability distributions. Once you, once you, if you, I measure the light on a pixel, the light on this pixel is not going to be a specific value of light, but it, it's going to be a range of potential values that actually captures, hopefully, the true light of the, of the world along that, the tray of the camera. Clear? And if I have a distribution as input in my estimation process, well, as output, I will have to have a distribution too. All right. So, that's the lemma. There is not a single possible value for the state, given the classical estimation pro problems, but there is a set of potential valid solutions. Not every of these solutions has the same probability, but you might say I might land up in a certain uh, location, in a certain state. Now, this is the classical, I hope you, everyone sees, this is the classical relaxing, comforting, uh, discrete time dynamic, non-linear dynamic system. Hmm? I think uh, all of you are kind of relaxed with that. So now uh, I will introduce some nomenclature that we will be using during the course. Uh, this is the classical deterministic model of a, of a discrete time uh, continuous dynamic system or dynamic system in general, not necessarily continuous, uh, where we have that uh, hmm? mouse. Okay, where well, we have that uh, the central notion, the state of our system, is denoted by x of t. Imagine, I don't know, a moving robot, right? Where the state might be the location of the robot in the environment, right? You might have controls. The controls are the velocities that you issue to the left and right wheel, or the controls might be the current with which you uh, drive the motors, right? This may be controls of your simple dynamic, uh, dynamic system, your robot. Now, if I give you a location and I give you maybe 
I don't know, a velocity for the wheels or uh, an offset, uh, uh, how much they turn, you could predict me, you could predict where the platform will end up in the next instance. Is that correct? Is what you have done in, in robotics, right? in uh, AMR. And that's going to be what? That's going to be the state transition function. That given the control, given the state, current control and current uh, state calculates the next state. Okay? And that's standard. So we are going to call U the controls. We're going to call uh, X the state. Uh, F traditionally is the state transition function. Then, uh, and that's it. And in this way, you will have a system that goes out blindly. Right? Your robot, you can issue controls and your system moves, moves, moves. It evolves its state. But actually, there are no sensors on this robot, right? I mean, th there's nothing with which we can observe the state. We have only one control, this object over here. We have only, only the input, right? Only the control. And the state is going to evolve. At the same point, you hear, boom, this means that the robot hit the wall. Now, what can we do? We can sensorize our platform. Sensorizing the platform means mounting a device or something, mounting a function, whose outcome depends on the state. A camera or a laser, let's say a camera. A camera is a function that, given the map of the environment, which is a constant in this case, and given the location of the robot, produces a matrix of values, the intensities of the pixels of the image. Video games do it all the time. Once you have an avatar or a video game, you move in a 3D world. In, in fact, what you see on your screen rendered is the image that your character is going to observe from that point. Okay? So that's going to be a feasible no? domain. So the observations in this case could be the domain of the matrices of the, of the R, uh, 200, uh, 280 times uh, 320, no? if you work on a small image. This could be a potential domain of the observation. And H is the function that, given a set of constants and given the state, produces the virtual observation. No, no, uh, okay. I, I, will, uh, I will answer. Uh, there's a colleague of yours uh, that asks uh, um, um, illumination about this, uh, this part of the diagram. Because the system evolves. This delta is a delta t, the delta time interval. So basically this means that you start, this is a control, this is a previous state, which is the previous state which is obtained by delaying of, of uh, a delta, the, 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 state, the, the state estimated then these two things enter into the transition function, and then with these two, you can do the evolution. You end up in the new state, and then you get the new observation. Just think about it. You have a driving robot, no? You start from a certain state, x0, like which, let's say, x0 and u0. With x0 and u0, there's not much you can do. Camera is closed. Then uh, you issue a control. The robot moves, then you compute the next uh, location, and then from the next location, you can compute the next camera position. And then uh, what you do is that uh, you moved in the next location. So that's, uh, this xt, this the x1 uh, goes back here, gets feed, feedbacked. You get the next control and then you evolve. It's just a diagrammatic thing that is normally used in, di in the discrete time dynamics. It's one over z, I think, z z transform. I don't know how it was. I don't remember well. So, uh, one over z, if it was a dynamic system. Z, blah, blah. All right. Now, uh, this is a nice deterministic system. This is a video game. This is how video games work. Because video games, they don't have to deal with the uncertainty. They have everything there, right? You can just render a perfect model. They want to get rid of the, the, all possible uncertainty. Also Unreal, also when they make movies, they want to have the sharper possible images. Or not too sharp. Actually, they want to inject some noise to make it more realistic. But if they could, if they go to, I don't know, 
now they have 8K, 20K, whatever. No, it's like they, they will reach sub-rating a resolution that people, that is going to be completely useless, waste a lot of energy, but people just want to put another number in front of this K on the screen. So that's how humans work. Uh, anyway, um, what we're going to... So this is a purely deterministic system. But it's perfect. We also will work with that. We will work with deterministic systems and then we will massage them in order to get a stochastic model. It's not because sometimes you have to look at the reality. You don't, you don't get uh, you know, obsessed with probability at the very beginning. First you have to describe what you have and then you have, to see, you have to see where the noise enters and then you propagate this noise and then you get some sort of distribution of it. What we will be working, however, is, uh, um, uh, is our dynamic systems of this form. What we have here is that the variables are not anymore variables, like numbers. N the location, the position, for instance, if we work in SE2 is x, y, theta. We're not anymore working with a single value of the location for our state. Imagine our localizing robot. But we will have a distribution over state. Now, for a second, remove the theta component. Assume that our robot can't uh, rotate on the spot. It can only translate. Just for, for simplicity, how do you visualize one possible state distribution? Well, it's just going to be a surface on x, y, where the higher is going to be, where the higher peaks denote a higher probability that, that, the, the, that the robot is actually in that location. How do I model the absolute knowledge that uh, my robot is in a location? Then we we'll just put a Dirac in the position where the robot is. And then you go back to the deterministic case. But we will see it later. However, how do I tell, how do I express a little bit, I will not say formally because it's not a word that I like, but I would, how do I write down uh, the notion or, or highlight the fact that the system is stochastic? Well, first of all, the variables become, as I said, stochastic. So I don't have any more value, but I have a, a, a distribution over these possible values. More technically, a probability distribution is a function that for each element of the domain maps either a probability, uh, a, 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 a probability a number between one and between zero and one, that, that, that the, that's that value uh, for that value, such that the sum of all values sums to one, but we will have a known lesson of probability in the next uh, episode. Just think about it as if it were so, right? Now, Okay, you're right. This is one single value, a distribution. And this is a stochastic product. But then, how do I manage and how do I model these uh, variables? Now, I go back to the previous slide and look at, for instance, this component. This is a function that has a domain, which is the domain, SE2 in this case, the domain of the robot positions, the domain of the controls, and has a, co has a co domain, which is the, the, the domain of the robot position, again, right? Because it's the state. Agreed? This is a function that has a domain and a codomain. In case of a, so, let's think through. So these two elements, these two values here, they control the output of the function. They control the value which will be produced in the codomain. Right? Very good. Now, this object here is a probability distribution is a probability distribution over, you see a bar here, we will expand everything in the next uh, lesson on Thursday, but just to give you the hint. Probability distribution that is defined on the variable xt. Only on the variable xt, okay? It's not on the other variables. It's just a, look, here I have xt, right? So this must be a probability distribution of what? This is a probability distribution of the next state, clear, of the next state, xt, given the knowledge of the previous state and the previous control. So, wait a moment. It's a probability distribution thing. This xt is a stochastic variable. It's like, uh, you know, this uh, um, surface with, with a hill, which is the, the location where the robot is, right? And what are these two objects here? making? Well, it's a function, right? So if I change the input of this function, I'm going to change 
I'm going to change what? If I change the control, imagine that xt, the, the next state is in this lock, in, in such a location. Well, I have to see uh, myself in, in here. So, hmm, maybe I can do something even better. Uh, OBS. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that uh, for the people at home, so that when I move the hands, they can understand. So imagine that uh, I have uh, a hill here. So this is my distribution. If I change, uh, for instance, the state where I start from, the location where I start from, and I apply the same control, what do you expect to happen? that the next state distribution will be which may be shifted, right? Understood? What happens if I change the control? Well, the next state distribution will be shifted in another way. But this is the next state distribution. It's just a, a distribution over the possible, oh, over the possible, this, this, this. Sorry. Uh, distribution over the possible states. Okay? That is controlled, so it's a distribution over the next state, but that is controlled by the previous state and the previous control. Understood? So it's a machine that you insert two deterministic values and produces you an output an output distribution. Depending on the, on the, on the description. Uh, your colleague asks uh, uh, whether if only the position changes or also the shape. The answer is it depends on how you define this 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 function over here, okay. and you define this function in a way that it reflects the true system, or it's cl as close as possible to the behavior of the system. But in general, you can see that uh, the elements that appear on the left of the bar are like two knobs, two manovelle, two manopole, with which you control the output shape. Okay? This is when you see a conditioning element. Similarly, when we talk about images in your system, we will not have one single image, but we will have a distribution over potential images. Albeit it's impossible to think about it, just imagine that this object exists. Right? And uh, we will have a distribution. Now, if I give you a perfect location of my robot over here, a perfect state, but you have a lousy camera that doesn't really work well, well, you can't predict what your system will see exactly because you will have some blur or, or stuff like that. But you can predict the distribution. So by knowing the previous state, so you turn the knob until the shape of, of, of until your image or your distribution over potential images becomes uh, like, and, and not until, until you turn the knob until you match the true state xt, or the expected state. And then uh, once you have it, you will have as output a distribution of potential images. Okay? So I'm talking about the transition, the, what we call an observation model. Right? So like, when going from this definition to this definition, you find simply that uh, um, if you would write uh, expand, e extended uh, this thing, you will have xt equals f of t uh, minus 1, xt minus 1, ut minus 1, right? If you want to write a probability distribution that uh, separates the causes from the effects, you put the output xt on, on, the, on the left of the conditioning bar, and you put on, on the right of the conditioning bar the elements that are controlling the output distribution. And the same happens here. Here you will have z of t equals h of xt. Uh, so z of t is equal h of xt. And then you will have z of t on the left of the conditioning bar and xt, which is the current configuration on, on the right of the conditioning bar, because the parameter that controls the distribution. But I repeat, we will see extensively this notation in the next, uh, so on, on first Thursday. Uh, um, XT is a distribution. Ah, okay. So this is produced from the observation. 
xt is not deduced. We, it's only a generative, mo a generative model. We're not, now, we're not doing any regression yet. We're just saying, okay, this is the state. If the state is deterministic, so your colleague asks, uh, um, if I have, uh, 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 if I can only see z, how can I infer x, basically? And this is called regression, and this is what we're going to be doing. But in order to do so, first we have to do the easy way, which is describing the forward model, Des describing how the machine works. And then after we describe the, how the machine works, and this is good because we can read it from the specs and whatsoever, then we will do inference, and then by looking at z, we will go back to x. Yeah, that's uh, the, the, the task of this thing, <laughs> this course. So exactly. So now, this is more or less the, the setting where we will be operating. We will not only talk about dynamic system, we'll uh, talk about also stationary systems or large uh, um, optimization problems in general, but um, in general in probabilistic terms. What will I learn in this course? I mean, uh, I think you have heard, you have spoken with your colleagues, and, and, and friends, uh, you will learn filtering. Filtering, uh, many of you had, or had already encountered this uh, uh, in a, um, mm, how to say, specific uh, circumstantiated way in autonomous and mobile robotics, I think, right? AMR, or system identification. Where did you encounter filtering? Uh, in reinforcement learning, okay, you encountered there, filtering, Bayesian filtering, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. We will talk about filtering in the discrete case, in the Gaussian case, with particle filters. We will talk about filtering. What is filtering? See next slides. Right now, we will see filtering. We will see, uh, in general, is the process of estimating the current state given the history of the previous observations and the previous control. The current state distribution. We will see uh, maximum likelihood, li likelihood estimation which means uh, given a trajectory, a, a history of measurement, and a history maybe of control, but a history of observations, I'm interested in determining the most probable, the most likely configuration of the world, and maybe its statistical parameters. So, also a distribution. It's called maximum likelihood estimation. Maximum likelihood, you don't do it on the fly, you do it once. An example that where you encountered maximum likelihood estimation you remember when you did in robotics uh, the calibration of a of a, an arm, the, the dynamic. That's a maximum maximum likelihood estimation. If you would repeat the pseudo inverse a couple of times, relinearizing every time, that like that's in general the problem is linear, so you don't need to relinearize. But if the problem wouldn't be linear, by repeating linearization in solution, you would do be doing maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, and we will play with Gauss-Newton's, parsley squares, last pro problems. Then uh, these are all algebraic tools, or mathematical tools. Of course, we will see a lot of modeling. Uh, and the problem is that sometimes we have just the data, the, the sensors, the, the, the images, whatever, that are, that are producing our quantities, right? Not always we have uh, fantastic uh, motors with encoder ticks that gives us an absolute value, where we know which motor is the left and which motor is the right. So that's an ideal setting. But when you observe an object, you see a fire extinguisher, it doesn't tell you which fire extinguisher it is. And then if you want to formulate a filtering problem, maybe in your state you have two extinguishers, one to the left and one to the right, and you have to figure out whether this particular instance of fire, ext fire extinguisher that you are observing refers to, with, to which element of your memory. So determining which observation generates which, which data and which state component generates which data. And this is called the problem of data association that we will approach it in many different techniques. This is the tools that we will learn. And I hope that you will take these tools and I'm, I'm, I hope, I'm sure that as a roboticist, there will be a moment in your career that you say, oh, I have my nice filtering toolbox, not in terms of software, but knowledge of what I can do and not do with, with a filter. And then you place a filter. Or I know oh, this is a trivial list square problem, bam. And then you shoot it out. And then the people that pay you will say, oh, then you're happy because you go home earlier, right? This is the game. Uh, I had feedback from the people that I sent, uh, that I sent, that went around uh, on of this sort. Oh, that was very useful. Uh, 
we will see these are the tools, but then uh, there's no tool without example. And so we will apply all these tools in real practical problems, which are calibration, and what is calibration? You will see it later. Tracking, localization, mapping, and slam. But then I don't want to continue because I expanded the slides uh, so that we can talk about, uh, at least introduce the problems. So filtering, as I said, is the process of estimating. We're talking about dynamic system. It's the process of estimating the current states, current distribution of states of a dynamic system given all the previous controls and all the previous measurements. The classical filtering problem is, for instance, localization. If you want to localize a robot, well, what localize means determining the position of a moving robot. What you have available is the encoder measurements, maybe, and the, um, and the observations. Maybe if you have a landmark sensor, whatever, you might have an, an access point, and you might want to measure the signal strength to the access point. That's going to give you an insight where the robot can be in the environment, right? Okay? And this is the observation. If you put these th things together, you might get uh, an accurate or a reasonable, depending on the quality of the data, of course, estimate of the position of the vehicle in the world. In this case, the state is going to be the ro robot location. The controls are going to be the velocities that you issue to the wheels, which in the end means encoder tips, or the observed encoder tips, and the, the measurement is going to be the access point signal strength in a specific location, okay? We will see, as I said, the data association problem, and uh, this slide explains you an idea. So imagine that I have three things here, one, two, or three. And I imagine that I have my robot that sees three fire extinguishers. These are the fire extinguishers that I have seen before, right? Then I move a bit, I open my camera, and I see two fire extinguishers, which are right in the middle. And in order, I presumably moved, in order to figure out whether, so by knowing whether this observation refers to this item or to this item, and vice versa, whether this observation refers to this item or to this item, I might, by doing inference, end up figuring out that the robot either in one case is located, let's say, facing this way, and in the other case, the robot is located facing, facing this way, because I will have to move the observations to match the state variables, right? How to determine which observation is the best or is reasonable? That association. Other thing uh, that we will see is MLE. Now I will play it back. Bim. Now, the idea of MLE, maximum likely estimation, is to estimate the most likely trajectory of the system state. So not one single system state, but all the history of the states of the system, given all the measurements acquired so far. Right? Why do I need to, to do that? But for instance, in, a ca in case I want to build a map, the trajectory of the robot is something which is very useful, right? Because if I would know perfectly the trajectory of the robot, then constructing the map would be easy because I would just like put the observation where, they, where I've seen them. Agree? But while the robot moves, I might accumulate drift and whatsoever. Assuming that I have solved the data association, I might formulate a problem that determines the, the trajectory of the states that is most likely consistent with the observations, given a certain data association or not. This problem is called maximum likely estimation. So this, uh, so this tool, this family of things. In terms of, of practical problem, we talk, uh, for instance, of calibration. We will enjoy constructing programs that calibrate, let's say, the kinematic parameters of a differential drive system, uh, the location of a sensor, a Vicon system. So we might uh, be interested in putting some cameras in the environment. We just like uh, rent. Uh, uh, we do it ourselves. Uh, uh, and maybe, uh, you know, they're not going to be super perfect. Uh, but then it doesn't matter, because sometimes uh, if you lay a posteriori, you, you tell to the system exactly where they are, even if they are not mounted in a millimeter way, who cares? The software can compensate for this, right? So you can actually, like this is also done in some commercial system. I know that there are some devices that uh, uh, are sold for thousands, and the, the practical cost is uh, ten, hundred, hundred dollars, so thousand versus hundred, just because they buy crappy sensors or relatively cheap sensors. They do a super fine calibration of these devices, and then they sell it for a thousand because it looks much better. 
right? So calibration is the first thing. It's often underestimated, but believe me that uh, it's going to change your life, especially when for people that do co computer vision sometimes, no? Like uh, the, the big difference when you do computer vision, I'm talking not about uh, um, the deep things. I'm talking about the geometric computer vision. Well, in this case, working with a nicely, perfectly calibrated camera, not perfectly, but optimally calibrated camera, and with a different camera parameters might lead to completely different results. And you might think that the problem is in your program, while the problem is not in your program, is that you didn't calibrate the camera correctly. And it's very often the case. They, you say yes because you feel it, right? You, you did it yourself. Then, of course, we will talk about tracking. So this is uh, all, uh, all software is in-house. Uh, this was a Kinect camera, no, that camera, run into a previous edition of uh, um, uh, probabilistic robotics, still in the A1 classroom. I was sweeping around, and then in this program, all what you were interested in is to estimate the location of the camera with respect, tracking the position of the camera by feeding the, all the set of observations that you're get, gathering over there. Uh, we will deal with localization, of course. Localization which can be global or can be local. Localization means, as I said, uh, determining the position of a robot given the sequence of observations. In this video, what you see is at the beginning, the robot doesn't know where it is, and this is represented by this uniform distribution of these red dots. And then at a certain point, after moving, and after gathering new observations, all this, this, this distribution converges into a small peak which is represented by these samples, which are all densely located around the location of the robot. Localization, we will see it, this. We will see, of course, SLAM, which is, stands for simultaneous localization and mapping, which means uh, you turn on your robot, you joystick it around, you joystick it around, it doesn't go around uh, actively, but you can joystick it around, and then it, you, by gathering the data, you determine the, location, uh, the map of the environment and uh, the uh, position of the robot. What you see here is a classical, uh, is a fusion of things in general, a slum system, because you have a component of tracking, you might have some sort of filtering inside, you might have uh, maximum likelihood estimation, as you can see when the system, uh, when the robot re-enters in a known location by going open loop. Now it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it turns back. You see that after this long traversal in the unknown, it has accumulated drift. But then by relocalizing with something it has seen before, that association and the uh, uh, and maybe localization, then you can determine where, where you were with respect to the past. And then you can revise all your previous trajectory in order to accommodate for this new evidence. And then the map gets rectified. Okay? We will see this. Tools. We will work on Linux. This you already knew. Preferably. You can also, this is not mandatory in this course to operate on, uh, you can also take your Windows box if you are attached to it or, or, or your Mac, only that uh, we provide, uh, because the programs are mostly in Octave, okay? I can't guarantee that, that these, uh, these things will run uh, uh, untouched, especially if you run the GUI or something like that. So if you have a Linux installation, it's better, but most of the stuff that we will execute here will also run, presumably, on Linux, okay? Uh, and uh, as a difference uh, uh, from the previous edition of the course, I think I will not talk that much about ROS because there is an exam, there is a course on ROS now in the first year. I might mention something. Uh, and, um, but if you have a Linux box, you can install some more software and enjoy better the thing. That's the message. Exam. It sucks, but I have to talk about it. The exam is written, it's composed by two things, a written part that you can do, it's a, a written exam, no? You get the exam that comprises one question of theory and two exercises. In the theory, you can't use books. Uh, during the, the uh, exercises, you can use any paper material, non-digital uh, material with an antenna, but any paper material uh, you want, right? Uh, uh, in case we are undecided, typically we ask one question, but normally you are always happy or you always acknowledge the grade that you receive. Uh, 
we will provide during the course exercises uh, so that you can train. And remember that the exam is not complete without you handing in an individual project, right? That's part of the exam because we will have a lot of theory. And I'm convinced that theory serves uh, for fixing the concept and for understanding what you did, the practice service to fix the concept and to understanding where you didn't understood or not. And if you never do it, you will never learn. So do the practical and do the project. This is all. There will be exams regularly during the year. No, it's like nothing is spectacular. And they, they normally all appelli is open to all students. So you have seven chances to give the exam a year. Regardless, fuori corso in corso. Huh? All right, now I take a break. I answer the, presumably the questions that are on the, on the chat. And then uh, we continue with the next uh, part of the episode. See? No, there are no questions on the chat. I like it. Five minutes break? It's well seen. Uh, Fox, I will leave the, um, the streaming on uh, because, uh, because otherwise reactivating it is painful and then I continue uh, in five minutes. If you have questions, post them in the chat.
let's see if there are questions on the chat and let's become visible again. I saw one question that asked uh, whether projects in uh, um, groups are allowed. In general, not, uh, unless there is something spectacular. But my recommendation is that do, do, we, we try to give projects which are not obnoxiously difficult. They are satisfactory because one has to, needs to have some fun, but they, 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 we trim them a little bit so that because the pri priority is that you finish the exam, you ca capitalize your course of study, you learn what you have to learn, no? It's, it's, a, it's a means. And then if you want to continue, there is thesis, there are other things that you can do. Or you can also use these skills uh, within, other, uh, for, uh, within other exams. So that's why we, we rather prefer to have uh, um, uh, individual projects. No. This is the cheap lesson. Now we are approaching lunch. So, uh, uh, talking about blah, 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 like, uh, uh, blah, blah, as uh, yeah, someone says about uh, robot centers and our, uh, uh, let's say, flagship robots that uh, we built here and you can build yourself if you want to play with some of this stuff. So. Let's see for a second some sensors that we will encounter or we will deal with in our uh, in this course. The first sensor that you encountered are uh, wheel encoders. I think, uh, have you ever seen a wheel encoder dismounted? Do you know how it works? Yes, plenty of uh, answers. Stop being interactive. If anyone has seen uh, uh, I will I will answer to all questions at the end of the of the pool. Uh, but study material is all on the on the web page uh, and uh, all on the on the repo and the minimum number of components is zero. Uh, the maximum number of components uh, is one to two, but it's, it has to, I ask, I am, uh, so Fulvio asks, which is the maximum number of uh, components in a group? This has to be linked with a project, but my tendency is to preserve you from doing group projects, okay? You try to do a project yourself. Uh, because it's formative. Uh, so, uh, we were talking about sensors before. No one of you has ever seen an encoder. Right? No? Okay, the encoder works, is a device that measures, you know, the rotation of a wheel. There are many classes, but the classical one, the most used one, is the optical encoders. The encoder, if you dismount, it is consisting of two, or an old mouse, the mouse with a ball. Did you ever smash one? We are already in the era of the ball mouses. Yes. Yeah. You smash them. I mean, okay. The, the ball mouses, if you were opening them, they were having the ball, ball mouse, hands. Then there was, there were two, you know, uh, kind of cylinders. And at the end of the cylinder, there was a, a, a wheel, a um, gear wheel, right? With rotor and top. And then, if you move in one direction, the ball rotates in one direction, the, 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 the wheel rotates uh, in the opposite because it's a wheel, uh, um, in, the, in the opposite direction. And then how do you register the motion of the wheel? Well, there were two um, light emitters uh, on one side of the, of, the, of the wheel, not one, two. And there were two photosensors. Now, Imagine that uh, the wheel was rotating in one way, then you were seeing closed, closed, open, open. You, th you had a certain pattern. If the wheel was rotating in the other way, you were seeing closed, closed, open, open. So depending on, on the um, shape of the waves, of the, of the trigger that you're receiving, you, are you can decode it 
with a state machine. This is a classical optical encoder. Of course, this is done by some either dedicated or hardware or firmware uh, that runs somewhere, that reads the encoder. Okay? So in this way, you can figure out how much, how many ticks you move on the left or on the right. There are mosquitoes that are like as big as bees. It's like gabbiani. Uh, all right. Uh, this is how encoders work. They are fine. They are nice. Uh, you, have, you can have also deterministic encoders. Which are, this is the relative encoder that only tells you whether you relatively move to the left or to the right, but you can make it um, absolute by maybe uh, limiting the excursion, the, 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 the range of the wheel, and then by mounting a notch, especially another pin somewhere that when it goes, when it's enlightened, you know that it's, th that one is you, okay? And in this way, you will have a calibration round that you have to find the zero, and then from that point on, if you don't lose anything, you will be able to track the position of the wheel. Uh, of, yeah, of the wheels. Of course, uh, uh, they are nice. Uh, I kind of like the encoders. Um, and they are typically used for, in mobile robots, to calculate the ego motion of the platform. Another reason why you use the encoders in a mobile robot is that normally you control the motors in closed loop. And if you want to do a closed loop control, you need to have a, a, a position or a velocity feedback in the wheels. And this is normally handled by the firmware itself. But on top of it, you typically calculate some sort of odometry of which you are fond in autonomous human body robotics in uh, AMR. I think you have, you have encountered some sort of integration of motion of the robot. And if not, we will do it here. Another, and all these typically encoders are used to determine the relative motion of the platform. In the sense that if you lift the robot and you move it somewhere else, the encoder knows nothing. Right? The, the wheels, if the wheels don't move, the encoder says, oh, if you lift it and the wheels keep on spinning, not much you can do, right? Other devices that we are kind of familiar with are the IMU, inertial measurement uh, unit. It's normally a compound of different sensors, which are accelerators and gyros. If you open your mobile phone, you, you don't do it. But if in case you decide one day that you don't need any more mobile phones, you could decide to open it and then to determine which chips, which chip is the accelerometer and which chip is the IMU. And then if you slice it and you look inside it to, with, with a microscope, you, scope up, you discover how they work. The accelerometers are devices that uh, reveal the acceleration, eh? That's cool. And how are they implemented? Well, they are implemented typically in this uh, action thing that time through microelectronical MEMS, microelectronic from mechanical systems. It's a chip that integrates some sort of spring. Like, uh, it's designed in a chip. Of course, it's not a spring. It's maybe a, a, a part which is uh, like long and thin with a joint, right? It's like, the more you accelerate, there is a mass here. The more you accelerate, the more this thing will do like that. Maybe on this side, there is uh, some resistive material that, depending on the deformation, changes the resistance. You pass a, 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 a tension through it, and, and then you read the, you read the, the current, you read the voltage. Maybe there is a partitionatore, I don't know, a parter, par, par, voltage partitioner or something. You read the, the, the analog value, and then you figure out that if you accelerate a lot, then the, 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 the spring is, uh, the material is compressed, and maybe the resistance is lower, right? You have three on the three axis, and then you have a 3D accelerometer. Classical, normally, they this is how the accelerometer is constructed. Uh, the gyros, same story. Uh, but the gyroscope, I don't know if you have ever seen a classical gyroscope, is basically a disc which is mounted into a cage that uh, lets the disc, a heavy disc, that lets the disc spin. Normally, a gyro, you have to spin the disc like crazy, basically, and the disc has low friction, so it keeps on spinning. And then you can enjoy turning around the cage and the disc will preserve its, angle, its uh, um, axis of rotation, right? This is how it works. And, and now you can't construct something like that digitally, right? What you keep, well, there are the fiber optical gyros, but that's another story. MEMS typically implement a, a, a gyro by having a, a vibrating thing, a vibrating component, now, if you have a vibrating, an object vibrating on a plane, uh, like uh, vibrating on a plane, 
you can see that uh, um, if you turn in one direction or in another, you will find a momentum here because you, you tend to preserve the, the direction of the, of the plane of vibration. So if I, would, uh, uh, if I spin here and then I rotate this way, I will feel a force which is pulling me down. Right? That's how they work. And this is the gyros. And so like, uh, by, and they typically reveal what the, uh, the uh, angular rate. You have three of those mounted orthogonally, and then you, have, you are able to determine the rotation of the three axes, or you have an insight on the rotation of the three axes. You can imagine that you have a lot of noise in the game, right? One noise is coming from the temperature, for instance, because the hotter it becomes, the material becomes, maybe the softer it becomes. And if it becomes softer, maybe to the same uh, uh, angular rate or to the same uh, acceleration, a bigger deformation corresponds, which then in the end results in a higher value of tension. Therefore, inside, they integrate also a temperature sensor. So a gyro typically tells you the temperature the, and, the, and the rate on the, the voltage level on the three things. This is what you have if you open the box. And normally they are not even mounted orthogonally because they are integrated. They might be a bit like that, a little bit like that. They might not be like perfectly mounted. And normally what you need to do is to calibrate them to figure out because if you would know how, how they are put, then you can compensate for the event potential uh, offsets in the, in the construction of the device. Okay? Uh, compass is not uh, a compass. Uh, well, uh, a colleague of yours uh, asks uh, whether a compass is required in the IMU. The answer is like mo several, some of them they have it, but normally it's left aside. Uh, the reason is that the compass in, is in fact measuring uh, the Earth. It's, it's an absolute sensor. It's not a, a, relat a, 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 a relative sensor. But of course, you can integrate the compass and the compass. But the compass is not a MMC. So. It works on a different principle, but yes, you can have also mag magnetometers in the game. Uh, and these are normally the sensors that I use to determine the ego motion of a device. Now, you can have more expensive, cheaper sensors, but normally with these sensors, what do we do in our system? If we want to track a mov moving robot, these sensors become part, virtually part of the control because they tell that they integrate a relative motion and they tell you. Uh, they tell you where you're going to be, assuming that, you, um, assuming where you are, normally. Okay. Sometimes they can become part of the state. In case you want to construct a sophisticated system, you might also be interested in dynamically estimating the biases of the IMU, which is the temperature, so to say, of the IMU while it's moving. Because it becomes part of the state, it's an estimated quantity, and it can be adjusted as long as the system evolves. Because if you would know the, the bias, if you know how, it, the, your, how your IMU, how your, your thing, the temperature, you would be able to predict uh, the measure that you will calculate, assuming the true measure, that, uh, assuming the true measure of the work. Now, uh, these are devices to measure the ego motion. Normally, uh, and there are also other devices that uh, are used to sense the environment. Uh, Starting from the easy ones, uh, sonars. Sonars are nice underwater, uh, not nice uh, outside of the water, uh, because uh, uh, what is a sonar? A sonar is a cup, a pair, microphone, loudspeaker, so to say. The loudspeaker speaks, emits a tick in a certain uh, frequency and, and on a certain um, propagation cone so to say, depending on how it's constructed, the sound is typically 15 degrees. The sound propagates, bounces on an object, comes back, and uh, how do you read the sonar? You start counting from when you start the tick. At a certain point, you may hear the tick back, and then you stop counting. You divide it by twice the time of the, the, the speed of the sound, and then you get the distance of the object. They are nice. The problem is this 15 degrees cone not that accurate, right? You can't do many millimeter measurements. But, I mean, we successfully managed to localize a robot. It's not a big issue to localize a robot with a sonar. That's, it's tough to build a map. Uh, 
In, underwater they are really cool because underwater the sound uh, is the way to go. There are also uh, um, under, uh, underwater modems that work with sound because the sound moves so well in water that, uh, that it seems to be effective to transmit data this way. Of course, you don't have mega, uh, mega range, but uh, sometimes also the radio waves don't work in water. So there's nothing else you can do. But this is not my cup of tea. Another thing that we will encounter is laser scanners. Actually, laser scanners, they were incredibly expensive when I was a youngster, so ages ago. Uh, like I remember, we were jealous of the Germans in the Robocup team because they had the lasers that were costing uh, 5 million lira. No, it's like uh, the equivalent of 5k today. Um, uh, and then we bought it and then we, we became less jealous. Uh, lasers are devices that work basically with the same principle of the late of the of the sonar there is there is a, a, a couple emitter receiver the emitter emits the receiver receives huh? and uh, uh, by measuring either the time of flight and some other things like the phase offset of the light uh, the light wave when it's received you can get an idea on on, uh, on where an object is if you are any of you has ever had uh, one of these laser meters the pistols that tell you the distance between uh, uh, you and an object, they are based on the same principle. Uh, if you take one of these uh, 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 pistols and you mount it on a mirror like at 90 degrees and then you mount the mirror on a motor, no? you will be able to deflect the beam horizontally and then you will be able to measure the distance on a perimeter. If the mirror moves also on two axes, you will be able to measure to acquire a 3D scan, right? Normally, uh, 3D lasers nowadays, they have uh, multiple beams. so. They are they the velodyne or the car lasers. They measure the distances uh, um, over multiple directions and they rotate. So you get points not only on a plane but on a slat on any planes. Yeah. Yes, not even because it would be a plane only if it would be flat on n uh, cones. That's what you get. Uh, Another thing that you have encountered for sure, like taking selfies, is a classical monocular camera, which is nothing else. Uh, we, uh, we have spoken about it. Basically, it's an imaging device that takes uh, the intensity and projects it onto the, to a 2D plane to a certain projection function that doesn't need to be necessarily the classical pinhole model. It can also be a different projective model. For instance, if you uh, mount a mirror in front of a camera or you, mount a, or you look at the crystal ball, uh, the Christmas ball from the bottom, then you're going to be able to see 300, uh, 360 degrees, right? Because imagine a crystal, take exercise, take a crystal ball and look it from, from the bottom to the top, right? And then you will see that you're able to realize when the cup enters from the other side. And anyway, they have in common that they have in common that they are, uh, they are all, uh, Um, imaging de um, devices that uh, take a 3D data, luminance data, and they project it onto a 2D surface. Uh, other uh, um, what do we do with camera? Well, we do a lot of things because uh, they are quite informative and you can do also serious reconstructions, 3D reconstructions, just starting from a set of 2D images. What you will be able to gather from them is definitely the structure of the objects, assuming that you have enough contrast in the image. But um, what you will never be able to determine is the scale, because the camera is not able to resolve the scale alone. The camera just tells you, if you observe uh, a model of a house with a small camera or a big house with a large camera from the same vantage point, you're going to see the, ideally the same image. So the camera can't resolve alone the scale. So you're getting a model up to a scale. But of course, if you have just one encoder in the game, the scale is resolved because that's going to give you the offset, the motion between two photos from which you can determine the scale and then construct your model. If you have an IMU, the same. 
uh, another thing that uh, is kind of possible to find is uh, stereo cameras. Also in a commercial setting means that they have been factory calibrated and so on, where you have uh, stereo camera is typically de dealt with the, okay, you have two cameras. With two cameras, you can determine the parallax on a, of an object because if you identify a point in the image that belongs to the same point of the world, you will be able to pass two rays through the pixel, from the optical center, passing through the pixel and intersecting in the point which is being observed, and then through the geometry of the camera, you recon reconstructed that. This is possible, and this is also done in software, sometimes in hardware, uh, where the, the, the stereo camera, there are, the, there are some model of stereo camera that implements a chip that take, does a block matching. So for each region of the left image, looks tries to do a block correlation and finds the corresponding image on the right, on the right uh, camera. If, if it finds a match which ha has high response, means that these two small image patches are very similar, say, so these are the same, do the triangulation and then it labels that pixel with a 3D value. Okay? And that's the reason why we have two eyes, actually, like. We have, why we have two eyes at this distance? We have two eyes at this distance because they are optimized for manipulate, for, for giving you the parallax in objects which are in reach of your hands. If we were designed to look far, we probably will have eyes here. If we, if we had longer arms, they, we would also have further uh, eyes, which were further apart. Uh, other devices that we will encounter are RGBD cameras. Maybe, I don't know if they are even produced, but sometimes some new model uh, comes out. RGBD cameras are stereo cameras, of which one of the two is active. So, oh, there can be made in many technologies. But one dominant technology, the, the technology of the Kinect, was the one of having a stereo camera in one of the two, in which one of the two cameras was a light emitter that was producing a pattern on the image. In this way, even if I look at the white wall, it's not white because I'm projecting something. On the right camera, I was sensing this pattern. I, may, I had some algorithm that was recognizing in which portion I was observing the pattern transmitted by the, le by the left camera. I was doing a block matching, so between a reference and stuff, I was determining the depth, basically. But one of the two is active. That's the game. Or just like uh, uh, think about it as if it was, uh, if you'd have to build it, if I had to build something like that myself, I would build a laser blade, so a light blade, a light that propagates as a blade, a line, a uh, fan, that moves slowly, by knowing the encoder, the, the position at which I'm projecting, I'm automatically able to, to, to um, restrict the detection only on a very specific plane. On the left camera, all what I, if they are aligned, all I had to do is to determine where is this, this point uh, which is illuminated by the laser blade, and then I would be able to resolve for the depth if I had to build it myself. Uh, Another thing that we will encounter are uh, mobile bases. Uh, I think, uh, how many of you come from uh, uh, Sapienza locally? You, I think, yes. No, no, you too? All of you come, uh, come from uh, the bachelor, I mean, the bachelor program. Still Sapienza. Uh, how many of you did the laboratory informatica grafica morte? Okay. Three. Uh, okay, well, you encountered mobile bases. For the other ones, you will encounter mobile bases. Mobile base is a differential drive robot, typically, but you can have it also with three wheels, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, trucks. I prefer wheels. You can have uh, humanoid robots. I prefer wheels. Uh, you can have uh, also flying robots. I prefer wheels. Uh, because, but, but normally you can have in general, uh, we, we will play with simulated and real uh, mobile platforms. La why do you prefer wheels? Because uh, the wheels have a fantastic thing that they are cheap, they are small, uh, uh, they, they, if, if they don't fall. So the, the flying things, the flying robots, they have a big problem that they, they fall. And if they fall, they break, right? And once you program a robot, you realize that most of the time the robot is standing still and you're programming it. And if you have a flying thing, it don't feel good, like because all the batteries is gonna be drained and whatever. If you have a robot on ground, 
gives you a sense of security. Uh, and then if you want to build it, but this is just uh, uh, the thing, there is a design which is called uh, Martino. Uh, if you want to build your own robot, if you like it. Uh, uh, originally, uh, it was the first revisions, uh, the parts were 300 bucks, but I think that now with 100, uh, 150, one can build it, but you need to like it. That's it. Uh, we also, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that I'm not, I don't know how to remove this uh, uh, slide, this uh, shift F5. No, nothing. I mean, uh, you will read the link on the slides. Uh, still, you can, uh, uh, you can play uh, with a robot just like by assembling the parts. In particular, there will be an Atmel, Atimega, an Arduino board. You take an Arduino board, you flash on this Arduino board some firmware, and then you do some connections with the motors and the actuators, and then you have a mobile car. That's it. If some of you should be interested to play with it in the labs, just like raise your hands, and uh, I will you know, give you the story. And this basically fantastically concludes this hour and a half of lesson. Uh, I'm taking questions from here and I'm leaving the stream open in case I see some other questions. Fox, I'm here to get the questions. They are going to hear very loud from the me. No questions? Hungry? 12.38. I was hungry at 11. No questions. All right. So, folks, enjoy your meal. But I am, um, the, well, there are questions, um, mm, I re, uh, answer to Gotham. The materials are those on the web page uh, and those available on the repository. Uh, and uh, I answered already to Fulvio. Uh, the exam, there will, uh, no, there will not be, I don't know. You, you, you're giving me some interesting question. I have to ask uh, my uh, mm, my tutors, because it's not only me that has to deal with these things. Um, in case, would you be interested in having a midterm? Okay. But I, I, I didn't say yes. Eh? I said, okay, I register your, uh, your preferences and I will act accordingly. Now, uh, but that's also the second term. The, the, that's a midterm. If I would do a midterm, I would do the midterm in the middle after filtering, right? After filtering and that association, that I would do a midterm. And then I would do the other exam on, uh, um, on the least square business where I grill you. And, and then you do the first. But uh, uh, you would like it. Mm. Let, let me think, but let me think. But, yeah, maximizing the number of students passed is always my goal. I want to make a trial in the lab for a practical test, just to know. Uh, answering uh, full view, how many hours can last a trial in the lab for a practical test, just to know how much time to reserve in advance? I mean, uh, I would say if you're the only one, you can spend the day. If there are 20, you can spend, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, depending on how many of you are interested. First, I would like to know uh, who is interested. Of course, let, let some time pass, right? So that you, you get unquainted with, with the things that I say. But uh, the labs are for you guys. So, hmm. how to say, depending on how many you are. So, Fulvio asks, how many hours can uh, uh, last a trial in the lab? 
for a practical test with a robot, I assume. I don't know, if you are the only one, you can have the robot for one day, that's my answer. Or two, or a week, if you're the only one. If it's two, let's see. A differential drive, something like that. A Martino, uh, something a little bit cooler. Yes, of course. We, we, will, we will use, we will work also with simulation, so it's not that you have to use the real robot. And then in the end, we will also mostly do uh, passive estimation process, in the sense that we will not drive the robot. We will work on the data recorded with the robot, which is perfectly legal. It's like it has all the information that we need to do the things. And then, uh, all recorded uh, with the simulator, but... Uh, uh, to the extent of exam is not necessary. If you want to have fun, no, we're open for that. No, wait, okay, the number of the, uh, I see that the number of participants is constant to 15, so I have 20. All right. So, Sam, shall we say hello? Bye bye. <laughs>